Hi everyone, as Eva mentioned, I'm Dino and this is my friend and colleague Jelko. We'll be talking about continuous integration and deployment on Android and some sweets for the end. Uh, but <laughs> before we continue, I'd just like to short, short introduction uh, where our experience comes from. We work for a design and development agency here in Croatia and uh, we have 90 employees, most of which something like 80% are developers, which is a bit of an interesting fact, and 15 of those are Android engineers with various levels of experience. Now, since we're an agency, we have a wide array of different projects, which can range from a couple of weeks in length, or maybe even days, to years of development, even multiple people per platform, which means uh, we had a lot of chance to try out new stuff and see what works for us and what doesn't. And uh, our team in the last five years grew from one or two people to 15, and we've encountered some problems. And each time we encounter the problem, we try to found, found, uh, find a good solution to our problem. Now, in the beginning, uh, the first problem we encountered was that we were trying to develop new features for an app which was already in production, uh, which meant parallel in parallel fixing bugs in production and uh, and developing new features. Also, as the team grew, uh, we had to kind of coordinate better than than the people on this picture, and so that that was also a challenge. And I'm I'm grateful that Salvas was speaking before us about uh, Git and branching because uh, I want to tell you what we use. Uh, we use something very similar to Git Flow. It's a bit simpler. And as you can see on the graph, uh, the red line is master, and master for us is where production code lives. So what's in master is what's in Play Store. And all the development happens on the develop branch, which is the black line, and it happens in a way that you branch off development, start developing your feature. Once you're ready, once you're satisfied with it, you merge back into development and continue developing new features. When you're ready, to release a new release to Play Store, uh, then you merge back into master, tag the release and publish it into Play Store. Now, at any given point in time, you can branch off master to fix bugs in production. Once you're done, you merge back into master and you also probably want to merge into development so you also have the fix there. Uh, and the next thing we wanted to improve is of course code quality. And one of the worst things about software development, in my opinion, are regression bugs. Uh, this picture is completely accurate. So, <laughs> uh, well, regressions. Uh, let's say you develop uh, an app which has a login, and you break it somehow. And you fix it, of course, because you're a good developer. But two weeks later, login breaks again for a completely unrelated reason. Maybe it's not even your fault. Maybe it's the API. However, uh, all the client sees is that they're paying you twice to fix the same issue. So that's, that's the kind of bug that makes clients angry. And what's even better is that some of those issues are easily detectable. And for that, we started using static analysis tools. Uh, at this time, we use these four tools, Lint, CheckStyle, PMD, and FindBox, but we've also tried Facebook's Infer, uh, but we didn't like it because at the time when we tried it, there were a lot of false positives. And Google also has one called error prone, but we didn't get to that one yet. And just to walk you through them, uh, Android Lint, I'm pretty sure you all know it. It's the thing that colors your code yellow and red in Android Studio. So uh, you'll, you're probably already using it. And it's even, uh, by default, it's active on release builds. It will crash your build if you haven't Lint error. Uh, the best example for this is if you're developing, developing an app which has a minimum version of 14, so ice cream sandwich, and you're using some kind of method which is uh, available from Lollipop, on all the devices lower than Lollipop, uh, your app will crash at runtime. And Lint will detect that and warn you about it. So please use Lint. Uh, the other problem we had with code is the difference in styles. 
So we now have a team of 15 Android developers, and each of those people would have a slightly different style, and that could cause problems, because Jelko likes to go on vacation. And when he goes on a vacation, no. yeah, <laughs> when he goes in a vac on vacation, somebody has to maintain his code. Yes. Yes. And well, if he has a very different style from everybody else, then it's a bit of a problem. So we use check style, which is very configurable through, a, through an XML file. And you can also set it up so it works very similar to your Android Studio code style. So when you press uh, reformat code in Android Studio, it's automatically like it should be according to your check style. At the beginning, at, at the bottom, three code snippets which do the same thing. Slightly different format. Only the last one will pass the validation with our check style uh, configuration. The next, the last two tools for static analysis we use are PMD and FindBugs. And they both warn you about common Java pitfalls. One of them works on class files, the other one on source files, and they contain different checks, so it's good to use them both. And since this is pretty abstract, Java Net URL, I want to ask you how many of you have heard or used uh, this class? Good, I see some hands. Great, Jericho. And uh, well, this is a simple test. Basically, we're trying to see if these two URLs are equal. It should be obvious that they're not, but still, they <laughs> the, the behavior is interesting. So I'm giving you three choices. If, if uh, uh, well, are they, are they equal? So you have yes, they're equal, no, they're not equal, or it depends. So I want to see a show of hands who thinks they will be equal. OK, no one, that's good. Who thinks they won't be equal, which is the logical choice? Good, we have one hand. OK, two hands. Who thinks it depends? OK, that's good, very good. And it does depend. Yeah, uh, so what it does, it will do a blocking network request to get the IP of your server and then compare IPs if you have internet. If you don't have internet, then it will compare strings. And no, it's not a bug. That's what they say. It's a feature. Yes. Uh, this is from the Java doc. Basically, it's not considered an issue. It's, it's known and it's how it was implemented, how it needs to work, I guess. Yeah. Um, but obviously, it's not good. It's not good if you have one behavior if you're on the internet and the other one, yeah. Anyways, uh, this is also an interesting issue because this is one thing where uh, Android behaves slightly different than Java. I, all, all the time when you're developing Android apps with Java, you're sort of under the impression that it should work the same as plain old Java running on a regular JVM. However, in this case, they fixed this issue in Ice Cream Sandwich. So from going from Ice Cream Sandwich forward, this is no longer an issue. The URLs will always will never be equal, basically. One other interesting issue, mat.abs. So a very simple method, you give it an integer and it should return a positive value. You pass in minus one, you should get one, one back one. But for one value, it doesn't work as expected. Uh, so if you take a look at the range where integer is defined, you'll see that the lowest value doesn't have a pair, doesn't have a positive pair. So it just returns it back, <laughs> which, which can be very interesting if you're using that value and you need to be sure that it's positive. It can create some interesting Heisen bugs, I'd say. Uh, and th these are the kind of issues that find bugs will highlight. It will stop your build and tell you, well, you need to fix that. They even have helpful links to blog posts about it and stuff like that. And of course, that's not enough to keep those pesky regressions out. So we also wanted to add testing. And here you have a number of different approaches. There was a great talk yesterday from Janusz. And basically what we tried out is instrumentation tests, 
which are tests which run on the emulator on or on real devices. And the good thing about them is that they are very realistic. You know, you're as close to the real thing as you can get. The second uh, sort of variation is unit tests, plain Java unit test, uh, w in which you can't really touch anything Android related. So you have to mock it out. So that's a bit of a pain most of the time. And a sort of third thing is uh, functional tests. Basically tests which are a bit bigger than unit tests because they test one functionality. And in that, uh, we tried using RoboElectric. It's uh, sort of a library or framework, not sure what I could call it. But the goal is to mock out uh, Android. The goal is to write unit tests which are relatively fast, not fast like plain J unit tests, but let's say an order of magnitude faster than, than instrumentation tests. And we use a combination of unit tests and functional tests. We're trying to use less and less of RoboElectric because it also has some issues. Uh, but yeah, we're moving away from it, basically. And our tests are mostly centered around the client's needs and the specification we get. And to do that, uh, we use a number of diff different ri libraries. Each of them has a specific purpose. You've heard yesterday probably about Mokito. There's also OKHTTP's okay, web server, which enables you to embed a real web server inside your tests and sort of script it and tell it the next request made to you, you will rec return this JSON with these headers and so on. Dagger 2 for dependency injection and assert the Android for nicer assertions. And since this is all pretty abstract, I just want to show you one test. So this is a test we did for an Android SDK or a library. Uh, we did it for a client uh, which, uh, which wanted us to implement basically a wrapper around an API. So we have an API, API which supports registration, login, forgot password, and all those user authentication methods. And they wanted their users to have a nice Android API so they don't have to deal with the networking themselves. And this test should check if uh, the login response is uh, made correctly. Basically what it does, it uh, uses a helper method ca called enqueueResponse to take the JSON from this file and the test resources and enqueue it as the next response from the mock web server. And then we call the actual code we're testing, sdk.login. And after that, we ask the mock web server for the recorded request. So the mock web server records each request that's made to it, and then we can verify that that is the exact request we wanted to make. And as soon as we break it, we'll know it. It's not a pure unit test because you see a lot of assertions there. Ideally, it would be one assertion, but we'll, 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 we are really testing one functionality here, and it makes sense to have all the assertions in one place here. And of course, after we have tests, we have static analysis. To actually do anything with it, we need to run it. We need to run everything, and we need to run it often. For that purpose, we are using continuous integration. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know the, the gist of it. Basically, each time you push, a CI server will check out your code, uh, runs the static analysis and all your tests. And if the build fails, you will get notified. Not sure how, that's configurable. And if you break the build, you, you are expected to fix it, of course. And to do that, uh, we use Circle CI. It's a hosted CI service. It has nice Android support. On the right side is a screenshot of uh, build details from a single build. And each build has a number of steps, like checking out your code, running static analysis, running tests, collecting artifacts, and stuff like that. And each of those steps are configurable. It also has nice support for saving and displaying build artifacts. Like each of your build produces some artifacts, like APKs. Each of those static analysis tools produce an HTML report. So if your build fails, you want to be able to click on it and see what failed without rerunning everything locally. 
And uh, well, those are the upsides. Circle CI also has uh, some downsides, like it in integrates only with GitHub, no support for Bitbucket for now, no support for x86 emulators, which means you're stuck with the slow ARM emulators, and you have to be okay with the fact that your code is checked out into some server in the cloud. I think it's, it's in Amazon's AWS cloud. Uh, but there are other alternatives. We tried running a Jenkins server, we tried Travis, but this was the best fit for our use case. And now at this point, uh, this all sounds great. However, when you try to actually use this, most likely you get this, initially at least. The build will get broken at some point. And it either won't get fixed for a long time, or it won't get fixed at all. Now, before we go any further, I just want to clarify what does a broken build mean? I talked about having a lot of static analysis tests, and basically, if your build is broken, you, you get one information, red or green. And red can mean, A, you broke the test, you broke the build, okay? You broke, uh, you fell into some common Java pitfall like you're using URL class, okay? Or maybe you just forgot to put some braces and check style basically crashed your build. Or maybe it's even got nothing to do with the code itself, but you hit the four gigabytes memory limit which your container which builds the app gets, and then it just crashed your build. Or maybe the CI server is is it fault maybe the testing framework has has bugs or well android also has bugs so and yeah you get broken builds and there are multiple reasons why they're not fixed uh basically most most uh, stakeholders don't have a direct uh, reason to have the build fixed like the clients the client he wants the features done he doesn't care about your build the project manager and the product owner also cares about the client getting a good product, so he won't care about your broken builds. And he'll usually say something like, yeah, we'll fix the build after the release. You know, there will be time for that, just not right now. Yeah. And I actually had a call with a client about a month or two ago where I asked him about a feature. Uh, when do you need this done? And he said something like, I would love to have it a year ago. <laughs> and once we ruled out, uh, ruled out uh, time travel, yeah, and then we, yeah. Uh, and really, uh, for this, for this problem, GitHub released a very interesting feature like a year ago. It's called protected branches. And it means you can mark a branch protected, uh, which means you can't force push to it, you can't delete it. And you can also mark some status checks required. Now, Circle CI is a status check, and the first time you run it on your repository, you get this option to mark the to mark the check as required. Which means, uh, for our use case, we mark the master and development branch <coughs> as protected. And when you're done with your feature, you can't merge it merge it in unless the build is clean. This also means you can't bypass it. Uh, you, you see the grayed out buttons, but it also means you can't bypass it via the command line. So. And once it's clean, everything is uh, enabled and you can merge it in. And we enabled this at first for the project I showed you before with all the red builds. This is what happened. And I'm not sure if everyone can see, but the first commit after enabling protected branches says fixed all static code quality issues. So yeah, most likely it was some kind of missing brace or something like that. And after that, it's, it's smooth sailing. Basically, you break the build, you fix it. And why do you fix it? Well, because you're going to have to anyway, so why not just fix it right away? And it sort of gives you an excuse. When the product owner or product manager comes to you, I need a build, you say, I'm sorry, I can't give you a build. I can't merge. So yeah, it's, it's sort of a little backup. It's not a lot, but it's, a, it's an excuse, basically. And the last thing uh, was deployment. 
as we work with a lot of clients and a lot of them want pre-production builds, they want to see the app before it's ready for Play Store. Uh, they want to play with it, they want to see if they got something wrong while designing it and imagining the user experience. And so we built our own sort of Play Store web app, uh, which means we upload the APK to our Infinum Labs and uh, we write a change log. There's a nice QR code generated, the client gets, gets the link, he can scan the QR code, download it to, the, to his phone and just test it. And we also deploy to, to our labs via the CI server. Basically, we have a branch, or you can also do it via tags to, to do something. Uh, most, most CI servers uh, support this way of working. Uh, when you push a tag, then something needs to happen. So basically, the CI server uses a JSON API to push the APK, and the last commit message is used as the change log. And if you remember anything from my part of the talk, remember this. Try stuff out and see what works for you. I've shown you a bunch of things. It may not all work for you. Uh, maybe you like the master-only workflow better from Shazam. So just you just need to try it out and see what works for you. And now for something slightly different. OK. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So. Up until now, we were talking about how to minimize the number of crashes, problems, and errors in your code while you are still developing your application. But things tend to get a little bit more complicated when you publish your, uh, your app to production, because hopefully now it's used by a large number of users who are using that, that app in a, a million of different kinds of ways on different devices with different hardware configuration on different Android versions, and your app will start to experience some problems on at least one device. So you need to implement some, uh, some kind of a mechanism which will help you detect those problems in production and provide you with necessary information and tools uh, to cope with that uh, problem. So now we're going to take a look at some um, best practices, uh, libraries, uh, tips and tricks about how to implement um, some kind of that uh, mechanism. So the first thing are unresponsive apps. Um, so unresponsive apps are those apps who will at least once during their lifetime show that system dialog which informs that your app has become unresponsive. And this usually happens when you're performing mm, time or memory heavy operation on main thread. Because the thing is that Android OS is multi-thread. We have different threads. And uh, main or primary or UI thread should only be used uh, for updating the views or for propagating um, user interaction to your application code. Everything else should be migrated to some background thread because your application will start to flicker or it will block. And even regular users will notice that and they will complain uh, on Google Play. In order to fix that problem, you need to enforce a strict set of rules during your development process. Uh, so just don't block the main thread. Uh, you need to get familiar with multi thread concepts from Android, like async tests, uh, handler thread, thread pool, and 10 services, and so on and so on, so that you know which um, component you should use for your operation. And you can use uh, different tools from Android Studio to detect those uh, parts of your application which are either time consuming or memory consuming, like uh, trace view and DMT trace dump for um, time consuming operations and memory analyzer for memory consuming analyzers. For, let's say, best case uh, from my experience, um, you can use strict mode and uh, some kind of a library which will detect that uh, problems in production. So as Ivan said before, um, strict mode is basically a Google's way telling you that you suck at programming. It's some kind of, let's say, watcher which analyzes your application during its lifetime and it can detect uh, time-consuming or memory-consuming operations on main thread. 
You can define two penalties for that. You can defi define that penalty is lock, which will basically just write the lock to your system lock, and that's, well, in most cases, stupid because we'll just tend to ignore it. Or you can say that the penalty is dead. So basically, this will crash your application, and then you are forced uh, to fix this. So this is something that we can use in debug builds. So just crash the application and fix it. Um, obviously, we can crash our application in production. Uh, we can use uh, libraries like ANR Watchdog, which basically works the same way as strict mode. Um, but the main difference is that it can throw an exception uh, when some heavy operation is detected. And then you can lock this exception to your remote server or cache it somewhere in your uh, app that you are notified about it. OK, um, the next thing is a coding principle called um, crash fast. This is basically just a way how you organize your code. And we have only one rule, and that rule is really simple. You need to crash your code, your application, as soon as possible. So basically, when you have a method which takes some input parameters, you need to perform um, a large number of local validation rules at the beginning of method so that you cover all the cases. If something goes wrong, you need to throw an exception with some meaningful description. And if everything goes OK, then you return just the result of your method. And by using this approach, you will quickly uh, find out that using uh, that returning null values as method result is pure evil, because you know that something went wrong in your method, but you don't have any information about what actually happened. In order to better understand this approach, let's take a look at a simple code snippet. So let's define a simple person model, which would have uh, two string properties, name and surname, constructor, getters, and setters, and so on and so on. And let's say that we have a simple method which returns full name of that person by combining its first name and last name. And this method is wrong. Does anybody have any idea why this is wrong? Let's say that static is OK. Let's say that this is utility method. OK, um, this method is not null safe. So if person is null, it will throw a null pointer exception. So we can be smart, and we can actually check if um, person is equal to null. If it is, then just return null, because we don't have any values. But if it's not equal to null, then return the combination of first name and last name. And that's also wrong. Do you know why? OK. <laughs> uh, the thing is that if we return null, we actually don't know was the person model null, was the first name null, or was the last name null. If we have some more complicated example with, I don't know, five different properties, we don't actually know which of those pro properties had broken value. So the best way would be that you perform local validation at the beginning of method. So at first we check if person is uh, equal to null. If it is, then we throw some exception with some meaningful descrip description that we actually know what's going wrong. Then we should uh, repeat the same thing for first name and last name, and if everything goes OK, we just return the method result. So that's crash fast approach. Moving on. We are in production. We have to use some kind of analytics. We need to log and measure everything what's going on with our application so that we know um, if we have some problems. Um, fortunately, today we have a large number of great tools uh, for um, crash analytics, like Crashlytics, Apps Dynamic, Criticism, and so on. All of them have their uh, pluses and minuses, so it just so you you have to figure out which of them uh, is the best uh, solution for your uh, use case. And when um, crash is detected and locked to Crashlytics or some kind of that um, tool, you will get the full information about what actually went wrong. You will get the information about the device, uh, the um, um, Android OS version, and so on. And you will get the full stack trace of the error. And at that moment, you need to analyze a dead crash and ask yourself some questions which can help pinpoint you uh, the exact place in your code where the crash occurred and why did it occur. So you need to ask yourself questions like, um, is this crash only occurring on custom ROMs, on rooted devices? 
Is it carrying on when cheap and low quality devices with uh, poor hardware configuration? What's the frequency of crashes? Did the crash start to occur when we uh, published new feature to production? Or is this app, uh, is this crash occurring only on Samsung devices? Did anybody here had a problem when a crash occurred on a Samsung device? No? Well, well, that's great. Okay, so here is a Crashlytics dashboard. This is just an example so that you know what information you have. So you have the full information about the device, like uh, device name, orientation, Android version, percentage of free RAM, free space, and you have the full um, stack trace of the error. So you basically know um, how, uh, so you basically know what the problem is, and now you need to perform some analysis and fix it. After you fix your crash, it's important that you write at least one test so that you are 100% uh, sure that this crash is fixed before you publish anything once again to production. It really doesn't matter if it's unit test, manual test, functional test. It really doesn't matter. Just write one, two, or three um, tests so that you are absolutely sure that you fixed it. Okay, but those are crashes. Now we are using crash fast approach and we will be throwing a large number of exceptions. And we as developers tend to not care about warnings or exceptions because we only care about errors or crashes. And that's wrong. You also need to care about your exceptions and you need to log them to your remote server so that you actually know what's going on, what caused that exception, S because it can uh, pinpoint you or, we, or uh, be an answer to some more complicated problem. So as you are um, throwing a large number of exceptions, you will probably start to use try-catch block um, in your application code. Let's say all of your methods in presenters will be wrapped with uh, try-catch block. And in try block, you will uh, try to um, implement expected case and in catch block you will implement let's say unexpected case so that your application handles this um, exception but you need to somehow uh, send this uh, information about the exception to the server so that you know why ac why did it actually occur so let's once again take a look at a simple um, example let's say that we have a presenter which updates uh, the view and we have a method which will update some uh, text views uh, with um, data which is stored in person model. This method is wrong. Does anybody see what's the problem? Come on, Eva, you probably know this. Okay, so once again, person model could be null. And this is not null safe. So and we have a lot of utility methods which could return null values and we don't want to really update the view with null values so we can be smart and we can check <coughs> if the results from those methods are actually nulls or not. But that's also wrong because each of that method could throw a large number of different exceptions because we are performing um, local validation at the beginning of those methods. So we can be smart and wrap the whole method inside try catch block. If everything goes okay, the try block will be executed and if something goes wrong, we will print that exception to our system log and we will show some error dialog. And we are happy about it. We publish this uh, code to production and a few days later, you start to get angry calls from your customers or from your boss because let's say that this error is occurring on the first screen of your application. You will start your application. You will immediately be notified that something went wrong. You will click on the OK, or you will click on OK button on that dialog, and your application will, let's say, close. Um, and you know that something is going wrong in that method, but you don't know why and what, because you, then ha you didn't send any information about this exception to your server. So at, um, and in Finum, we used a combination of Timber and uh, Crashlytics to solve that problem. Uh, Timber is an 
library which serves as a utility on the top of Android's default lock class. It's developed and maintained by Jake Wharton from Square. And the m great thing about t uh, Timber is that it can be configured. The default configuration is called uh, debug tree, and it works pretty much the same way as, um, as lock class. Um, but we can, uh, uh, we can provide our own custom implementation uh, of configuration. And let's say that we uh, uh, provide our own configuration called crash report and tree, which will um, lock everything to Crashlytics, which has priority higher than verbose or debug. And let's say that we will use the de default configuration in our debug builds, and we will enable Crashlytics and set crash report and tree in our non-debug builds. And after that, we will lock this exception with Timber. In big debug builds, this exception will be locked to your system log. You can uh, analyze it and fix it. But in production builds, this will actually be locked to Crashlytics as non-fatal exception. So once again, you have the full information about the exception, the whole stack trace, but this is locked as non-fatal exception. And that's something that you want to achieve. You want to minimize the number of crashes on your Crashlytics and exponentially increase, at least at the beginning, the number of non-fatal exceptions, which you will fix um, in your uh, app updates and once again minimize them. But sometimes everything goes wrong. Your application just crashes because you have some use case which and I don't know, maybe you forgot to, to use try catch somewhere and your application just crashed. But there is a way how to hide that crash from your users uh, because if you think about it, crashes are in most cases just exceptions which are not handled by your application. Fortunately, you can define your own custom uncaught exception handler on your threads. And that's how you can hide those crashes. It's purely up to you how will you handle those exceptions. So you can either um, close your application, restart it. You can either notify users that something went wrong. You can hide that. It, it's just up to you. This uh, prevents that ugly system dialog that which will be shown that your application has crashed. And your users can notify that, and they will complain about it. By using this approach, you have to be very careful not to get stuck in app restart loops which can happen if the crash is occurring on first or second screen inside your application. Let's say that uh, we have defined our uncaught exception handler that in a way that it restarts the application when the exception was not handled. And let's say that this exception is thrown on splash screen or one screen as they are called today. So you start the application, it crashes, you hide that crash from the user, restart the application, and the exception is thrown once again, your application crashes once again, this is hide from the user and you restart it once again and then you're caught in that loop. Uh, the implementation is quite simple. So you just implement, implement unquote exception handler um, interface and here we are um, handling crashes in two different ways. So at first we want to know if uh, our application was in foreground or in background when the crash occurred. If it was in background, we would just kill the current process and that's it. But if um, the application was in foreground, we will kill the current process and restart the application on the main screen of our activity, of our application. You're probably wondering why are we killing the current process? Well, that's because this is the safest thing to do. You don't actually know in which state your application is when that crash occurred. You maybe have some form data Maybe you deleted your session object. So the best way is to kill the current process and restart it once again. And that's actually how most of the applications work. So I don't know if you noticed if Facebook or Twitter application crash, th that crash is actually hidden from the user. The application is restarted once again and the feed is reloaded once again. So basically, you, you know that something went wrong, but, but it's, it's hidden in a way. Uh, and after that, you just uh, set this uncode exception handler on your threat object in the application class, and the results are quite astonishing. So here we, here we have two different applications. Both of them crash when you click on test crash, test crash button. And the left one uses the default uncode exception handler implementation, and when it crashes, it would show the system dialog. 
your users are immediately notified that uh, application crashed and they can go to Google Play and complain about it. But on the right one, we use our own um, implementation. We restart the application and show the dialogue like, like something went wrong, they want to contact our customer support. But actually, we could just hide that dialogue and our users wouldn't even know that something happened. We would just reload the data once again. And that's actually quite a neat, neat feature. And also, um, for the last thing, I want to just briefly describe two Google Play features, which you can use to minimize the number of crashes while you're still in pre-production. Um, you can use alpha and beta test channels, and you can use stage ro rollouts. So alpha and, best, alpha and beta test channels are just pre-production channels uh, to which you can deploy your application. Um, those channels are limited only to a small number of users who have to be uh, personally added by the administrator of that Google Play project. So you have to, you need to have an invitation for that channel. It's not publicly available. And if something goes wrong in beta channel, you can fix it, redeploy it once again. And when you are ready for production, you just move the application from beta channel to, to production channel. And the last thing is stage rollouts. Um, this is just a tactic, how can you perform your app updates? So this is just used for updates, not when you're first, first publishing your application. Um, this just means that at first, your application update will only be available to a small number of users, like let's say 5%. If everything goes okay, you increase the percentage. But if something goes wrong, you can halt the process, fix uh, what's wrong, uh, redeploy your application to production. If everything goes okay, you increase the percentage to 10%, to let's say, and if something once again crashes, you just repeat that process. And then you are repeating those, um, those steps until you get uh, the full 100% coverage of your users, and then you update the store listings. So to round up everything what uh, I said today, you need to care about your crashes, exceptions, bug, bugs, errors. You need to minimize them every way you can. And if everything fails, you need to hide them from your users. And that's pretty much everything what we wanted to talk about today. Um, yes, we are also hiring. Salas, even if you are not happy with your, your job, we are more than, we will be excited if you could join us. Um, if you have some questions, uh, we are more than happy to answer them. Um, our presentation will be up in a few moments on speaker deck. It's already up. It's already up. Well done. Yeah. Also, if you are shy, we will be here today for the rest of the day and you can find us in the corner. So, what about the sweets you. You, you promised? I am the sweet. <laughs> so, questions? Thank you. Any questions, guys? So everybody He's likes not the single. sweet, <laughs> hence no questions. Thank you very much, Dino and uh, Please, one round of applause before the coffee Thank you. break.